Okay, so today we are going to talk about all kinds of stuff, but we are going to be focusing, if I can get to it, we're going to be focusing on the five elements and how these are used in Maoshan spirit fighting sorcery. We're going to talk about the difference between using the elements for healing as opposed to using them for, uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm calling sorcery. So, um, let me just go ahead and check. I'm on, you know, I'm on different platforms now. I'm on multiple platforms. I'm on YouTube at the thunderwizard.com, thunderwizard, D-O-T-C-O-M channel. I'm on odyssey.com. I'm not live there right now, but I'm on there. I am live right now, I believe, on Twitter and uh, on Twitch. And there might be a couple of others. Those haven't kicked in yet. But So you can watch me on Twitch. You can watch me on YouTube and Twitter. I recommend YouTube if you want to engage with me in terms of the uh, Q&A. But let's go ahead and take a look. I just want to double check and make sure what's going on with me. Make sure that I'm streaming. Okay, so according to this, I'm on Twitch, I'm on YouTube, Twitter, Daily Motion still hasn't gotten me together, and someplace in Russia, but other than that, we're good. All right, let's get back here. All right, let's uh, talk about five element Kung Fu. Oh, I, I know what I want to do. I want to check and see how the sound is. So give me a second here while I check my sound. Sound is good. All right, let's start talking. All right, so as you know, five elements. There are five elements in the universe according to multiple spiritual traditions. And uh, just focusing on two of the traditions, uh, this is how the universe unfolds. So in the beginning, there's nothing. And then, all of a sudden, there's something. So we go from zero, which is nothing, to the one. And we call that the singularity from which the Big Bang erupted. So from the one, you get two. You get yin and yang. Male and female. Uh, this light and dark. You get the two opposites, you get duality. So from singularity, you then get duality. From the duality comes the three. The, uh, the three dimensions. The upper, the lower, and the middle. From the three, you get the five. The five elements. From the five, you get infinity. So that's how it goes. It goes from zero to one to two, to three, to five, to infinity. So we are dealing with the five, five elements. Five elements that uh, create the universe. So the five elements, uh, as you've probably heard me talk about already, the five elements are not elemental things like the Greeks thought of. The Greeks you know, of course, the Greeks were the uh, you know the first to bring in the what we would now call the Western mindset. So I'm going to turn the music down because somebody says my voice is kind of muffled. So that could be on your side. I don't know if that's your side or my side, but I'll turn the music down a little bit. All right. So um, so the Greeks were the first to really bring what we would call Western. Uh, the Western mindset, which is very practical, uh, very physically oriented. So the Greek philosophers saw the world from that perspective, from a very materialistic perspective, and so they thought that the universe was built on these five different things. 
But the, but the five elements are not these five different things. In Western understanding, which also works very well, you have ether, air, fire, water, and earth. And in the Taoist, which is what we're talking about here, in the Taoist, we use wood, metal, fire, water, and earth. So these are not the things. They, it is how energy manifests into three-dimensional reality. Because you first have to create three-dimensional reality. You have the nothing, then you have the singularity, then you have duality, then you have the trinity. And then from the trinity must come physical manifestation. And from that trinity comes then this matter. This matter, or you can call it energy because energy is matter also. This matter comes into reality and it expresses itself in five different ways. As it manifests, it becomes more and more dense. So the first element that comes into manifestation is the ether or the wood. It can be confusing if you're using Taoist because the wood is a physical thing, but they use the wood to represent the, the movement, the flow, the function of matter, because it's all the same. It's five different expressions of energy turning into physical matter. So the first one is the least dense, which people call spirit. And again, Westerners, Westerners, tend to, um, sorry, I have to, I have to cover over the, the, uh, what do you call that? The, the uh, chat section or I'm gonna get uh, distracted. Uh, try and hold your questions until after. I mean, I appreciate that you're looking at the title, but wait until you, you know, let's, let's stay on subject. That makes me happy. Stay on subject and ask questions about the subject or about things you know I've already talked about. That's the best way to, get me to interact with you. All right, so the least dense of the five elements is the ether or the spirit or the, or the wood. Uh, Western magicians, they go back and forth because they get confused over the fact that ether is non-tangible. And, and that is accurate, it is non-tangible. It is, it's like plasma, it's energy, it's in the three-dimensional world that is matter that hasn't coalesced yet. So within the ether is the other four elements. Ether and earth contain all of the other elements within them. So uh, metal, fire, and water are transitory states where energy is trying to either completely come into its manifestation as total complete matter or earth, or it wants to be released back into its original state of ether. So when you're working with the elements, the two safest elements are wood and, and earth, or ether and earth. If you work with any of the other elements, you have to make sure to connect them all together so that you can get the balance. Because if you just focus on fire, you're gonna burn yourself out. If you just focus on metal, then you're gonna, you're gonna dry yourself out. If you're just gonna focus on, on water, you're gonna get waterlogged. And earth is good because earth contains all of them. Earth will ground you. Ether will elevate your spirit into, the, into your spiritual essence, okay? So this is the kind of stuff that you only learn. You're not gonna find this in books. You know, this is why if you're watching my channel and all you've done your whole life is to watch videos and read books and you think you know what's going on with this stuff, maybe you understand some of it, but you know, people want to argue with me over intellectual stuff and listen, there's just some stuff that doesn't, arguing doesn't enter into it. There's no your opinion versus my opinion, there's objective reality. This is a science. And if you want to become a sorcerer, you want to become a master shaman, a magician, you are going to have to accept that fact. The eight directions are the eight directions and the properties of the eight directions are the same. They don't change just because you've changed your religious or cultural or spiritual hat for the week. You know, this, this is a science. And uh, so if you've been 
studying this stuff because you've read a bunch of books or you've watched a bunch of videos or you've played around or you've smoked some weed or you dropped some acid and you want to argue with me about it, I, that's just not up for discussion. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm telling you after 30 years of practice, research and experimentation, this is what I found to be a fact about the elements. But you're not going to read this anywhere. You're not going to read anywhere that I'm aware of that you either focus on ether or earth if you want to just focus on one element and that the other three elements are transitory and you can get trapped and uh, imbalanced if you stick with one of those three. But if you're good, if you stick with ether or earth. All right, so um, on my, to my left, this is my right, no, to my right, to my right, all backwards here, um, you've got the five elements. Now you see those arrows? I put those arrows in there because I'm going to teach you how to use the five elements in a way that um, if you want to be a sorcerer and gain power, this is the way to do that. So if you've learned the elements uh, through traditional Chinese medicine or other types of things, then you have been told, rightly so, that you should use the elements in a clockwise fashion that you see here, starting in the east. By the way, this is upside down if you're using the uh, the Western model or even my model of the uh, thunder wheel, this is upside down. So water is in the south and fire is in the north. From where you're looking at, actually fire is still south. You know, I've got so many things going on in my head, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to talk. Um, I just came off of a, uh, a discussion board, a Taoist discussion board where there was somebody who was saying that, definitively saying, that when you get to the southern hemisphere, you flip the north and the south. And it makes sense, it was an understandable, and I'm sure a lot of people do it. And this, this person presents himself as a Taoist authority, but he says you have to switch it, because the north is water, and uh, in, the, in the southern hemisphere, when you go farther south, you get towards the South Pole, which is uh, where you know, there's ice there. You get to Antarctica and there's ice. So he says that has to be the water. And the north becomes the fire because as you go further north, you get closer to the equator and it gets hotter and drier. So uh, that becomes the fire. But magically, for some reason that doesn't make any sense, the east and the west are the same. So I see that as superficial. I see that as, again, somebody who's got book knowledge, not as much physical experience because it doesn't take into account the magnetic poles. That the, mag the, the, the charge of the poles, I forget which one is which, one is positive and one, and one is negative. That doesn't change just because you went to the south, the southern hemisphere. The magnetic poles are still the same. And uh, it is still, when you look at the globe as a whole, the northern hemisphere is colder and wetter. And uh, the North Pole always holds much more ice than, uh, than the South Pole. And even during ice ages, it was the northern hemisphere that got covered with ice and not the southern hemisphere. So it's still the same and we live in a globe. We don't live in two mirror halves of half globes. So it's important to look at, at this, you know, again, it's a science. The elements are a science as well. So uh, if you've learned uh, elements from a TCM perspective, traditional Chinese medicine, then you have learned rightly so, starting in the east there, where you see wood, you start with wood, you go to fire, then you go to metal, then you go to water, and then you go to earth. And that is absolutely correct. Earth can also be placed in the southwest, by the way. But I like it there in the center as well because that represents the function. So the function of the elements are, remember, the elements are the plasma, if you will. The, the energy that is coming, that is matter, that has not yet uh, solidified or defined itself. 
And so when that energy first comes into existence, it is ether, it is pure spirit. So this is why in the East you have wood or ether, which represents the rising sun, the birth of the soul, represents energy uh, in terms of spirit coming into manifestation. It has not yet uh, uh, turned into anything. It is the beginning of the formation of the self, the beginning of the formation of the ego. And then it gets a little more dense and it becomes fire. Fire, try to grab fire with your hand, you won't be able to, your hand will go right through it. It's still there, it's still something physical, but it's not something that you can grab onto and pick up and put down, put in your pocket or anything like that. It's still not, not solid. So then fire turns into, um, turns uh, wood, fire, let's see, where am I going? Wood, fire, air, water, and earth. So you're seeing uh, from one perspective, I got a little ahead of myself, you see from one perspective how the elements are solidifying. All right, so the progression, let's just get here to the progression we have here. The progression we have here is, dis, is a little confusing because if you go through the progression, you might see it as what's called the insulting cycle. The insulting cycle. And for years, I thought that for years, I thought that uh, what I was trained to do was the insulting cycle, which goes wood and then follow the arrows, wood, metal, fire, water, and earth. So the other progression that I just showed you is the generating cycle. It generates, it gives birth. Wood gives, uh, gives nourishment to fire, fire gives nourishment to metal, Metal gives nourishment to uh, water. Water gives nourishment to earth. All right, so that's the elements when you use them to nourish each other. But there's also another way to look at uh, energy manifesting into the three dimensions, and that is uh, what is mistakenly called the insulting cycle. And that goes wood, metal, fire, water, earth. And that represents energy as it descends through the body as well. So the five elements are ether, air, navel, fire, sexual water, root, earth. So it represents the density. So it starts at the least dense, which is ether or spirit, and the most dense, which is earth or total physical matter. So when you are meditating in the beginning and or if your focus in your meditations is to become a peaceful sad guru, you know, um, saint, then you might want to focus on the generative wood, fire, metal, water and earth. You can use the five element sounds as I teach them. You can go to thunderwizard.com and sign up, and I, I'm sure I teach it there multiple times, but you don't have to, you don't have to learn it from me. The five element sounds, you can go look those up, and you do those in the generative cycle of wood, fire, metal, water, and earth. So then there's a destructive cycle. Now, what's confusing is the way the destructive cycle is uh, listed. So they list the destructive cycle in, a weird, in this weird backward way where they say, earth is destroyed by wood, wood is destroyed um, by metal, metal is destroyed by fire, fire is destroyed by water, water is destroyed by earth. Um, and uh, then they say there's this insulting cycle, which is, you know, they use different terms like the generative cycle is the mother, the mother is nourishing. And then there's the destructive cycle, which is, or they call it the controlling cycle, which is the father and the father is, is controlling the, the unruly kids and getting them, you know, teaching them and disciplining them. 
And then there's the grandparent cycle, which I don't know what that does. And then there's the insulting cycle, which is supposed to be the rebellious grandchild. So this, uh, this, doesn't, this doesn't line up the way that's described. It may line up in terms of healing when you're dealing with the five organs of the body and how to get the five organs. Each one of these elements is associated with the five organs. You have wood, which is the liver. You have metal, which is the lungs. You have fire, which is the heart. You have water, which is the kidneys. And you have earth, which is the digestive tract. Okay? Um, so maybe in that, there's something I haven't learned. I don't know TCM, so I can't talk about that. In terms of sorcery, I have experience in that. And in that, the way to gain power. So you either want to gain balance through that meditative practice of doing the five element sounds, or you're looking to gain power. And you gain power by working as a shaman. So we could also split, you know, of course there isn't any one way to do anything. There's, there's, it's, a, it's a spectrum, it's a scale. So you can be anywhere on the spectrum here. You can be, you know, we, we call it the, um, the healer or the sorcerer. We can split it in those two. The healer and the sorcerer. Uh, the sorcerer is the shaman. So healer or shaman. Shaman is a good word because shamans are traditionally spiritual practitioners who work directly with spirits and energies and channel them so the the shaman is the one that goes to battle against negative spirits that fights evil spirits that communicates with evil spirit or sorry that communicates with spirits and gods and entities and deities and um, also allows themselves to be uh, to channel higher level beings to, you can also channel the elements, all right? So you're either a channeler, which would be like a shaman, uh, or, and or magician, where you are, you are working with these things, controlling them, all that kind of stuff, uh, or you are meditating on them and you are seeking balance. You can also do both at the same time. I, I do both at the same time. But if you want to gain power, through the, you want to call yourself a sorcerer, a magician, a shaman, because I would put the shaman in the realm of the, of the magician, then the controlling cycle is the one you want to do, which again, uh, it's confusing because the actual, when you, when you put the controlling cycle into action, which is what I'm doing here, right there, on, right there, I'm actually, uh, channeling the elements and um, using them in that fashion using the controlling cycle and when you use that the controlling cycle in practical reality then it goes from wood to metal fire water and earth so wood comes up out of the ground right so if you look at the wood uh, if you look at the wool where did it go if you look at the wood set, which um, I'm showing you here, let me get rid of the sound on that. So on the on the wood here, you can see this is where you you learn how to punch. Let's give it a second here; it'll, it'll come together. So uh, you can see that's that's similar to ward off. So the wood creates boundaries, and sorry, that's the sifu hands. Give that a second. That's the yin yang hands. Let's move past that. And, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> right, let's get past all that. So, here, there you go. So the wood is where you you learn how to, how to punch because you turn your arm into like a piece of wood or a plank of wood. So the wood is, is the beginning of uh, learning how to... forgot what I was saying here. Um, the, that expansive energy, right? And so wood comes up out of the ground and wood is destroying earth. So earth could also be, you know, um, non-movement. Earth is stable. So you're from a stable position and then 
the energy rises uh, and expands and expresses itself. So it's going to, like wood, it's going to create these boundaries. Tai Chi, by the way, Tai Chi is full of wood. If I had to pick an element for Tai Chi, the majority of it would be wood, the ether element. That's why Tai Chi is so good for generating chi, because that, if you want to generate chi, you go to the wood. The wood is the generator. It generates, it expands, so it creates chi. So what is it that destroys the wood is the metal. The metal chops it down. And in the five elements, we, we, we do, there's a lot of chopping motions in there, which uh, I'll talk about some other time. That's actually, it's not, it's not the motion of chopping that stimulates the metal. It's actually a meridian point in the forearm that gets stimulated. But um, the metal destroys the wood and then fire destroys the metal, melts the metal, and then water puts out the fire and earth soaks up the water and then wood bursts through because the water in the earth you know germinates the wood and the wood bursts through the earth so it destroys the earth so it is this controlling cycle that is used to gain power and so when you go up against negativity you use these five elements and when you meditate uh, on the five elements and you do the five element cycles in that fashion wood metal fire water earth you are actually cleansing you're getting rid of excess you're getting rid of imbalance in the organs which is why when people do it uh, who are doing the thunderwizard.com just from here thunderwizard.com the warrior 90 day lightning qigong people who are doing that in that fashion will tell you how intense the emotions are that come up. When you do the generating uh, cycle from wood, fire, metal, water, earth, when you do it in that cycle, and you chant those the sounds for each of those elements, um, you will feel a calming sensation. You will resolve issues, but it's more of a user-friendly. It's the mother coming to you. It's the mother coming to you and nurturing you and saying, it's okay, yeah, they're, they're mean, but you know, I love you, you're a good person, and you should forgive and cry it out and all that. But it's more user-friendly. Dad shows up and dad shows up and says, okay, I gotta discipline you, let's go out, I'm gonna teach you how to fish. All right, now focus, stop screwing around, you gotta get serious. So uh, when you do that with yourself, then you're really getting ruthlessly honest and you're really taking a look at yourself and you're really examining doing a lot of self-analysis and so it has a cleansing effect this if you do this with yourself if you have this kind of ruthless self-honesty then you will become bulletproof this is why you know these guys can go up against uh, demons and fight them with their bare hands because they have already been ruthless with themselves negative entities are entities that are not looking at themselves that are devoid of identity, uh, uh, devoid of self-awareness, that are running from the light, so to speak. So when somebody who is that disciplined, has that kind of, um, that ruthless self-discipline and self-honesty goes up against a demon, the demons are going to try and find a weakness within you. It's going to bring out the sadness or the anger or the ego or the jealousy or the something. So that's how one of the ways you know you're being attacked by a negative entity is out of nowhere, seemingly from outside of you, some intense negative emotion comes over you. That's uh, one of the ways you know a negative entity is coming after you. And so if you have already faced those things, if you faced your fears, if you faced your insecurities, your selfishness, your ego, your pride, your false humility, if you have faced all of these things, your selfishness, your unconscious uh, agendas. Now you know why I'm so ruthless with everybody. What is your unconscious agenda? Because if you're not aware of what your unconscious agenda is, you can be taken advantage of by other people, your own unconscious resistance, or uh, worst case scenario, a negative entity. But if you have that, then when it comes at you, you say, I've seen that. I already know that about myself. You can't use that against me. Whack! 
and you take that purity and you you uh, mirror it back to the negative uh, a negative entity, which must go running. My experience is that when I'm you know when I'm juiced up and I'm I'm practicing this a lot, all I have to do is walk into a haunted house and they just go screaming out. I've had people who were working with ghosts, you know. They would actually, when I walk in the room, they would get up like they were being pulled, you know, like a marionette, and then just like dragged out the door. When I talk about them later, they say, I don't know, something just, I couldn't, I couldn't stand still. Something made me leave. So uh, this, is, uh, this is how we use the five elements uh, in terms of magic. So as you know, and now let me give you a little update for those of you. Those of you who are part of my channel, you've been uh, doing this for a long time, and you know where I'm going with all this stuff, um, I have now just recently made the decision to teach my full knowledge publicly online. So that is uh, where this is coming from. Oh, look at that, still there. Uh, that's where this is coming from. Oh, that was good timing. So uh, I've just released the first of the five elements, which shows the wood element and the uh, Sifu hands, which I've already taught publicly. If you've gone and done the uh, the Immortals Qigong, you've already learned the, the Sifu hands. That's only half of it. There's, a, there's another part of it, which I haven't shared completely with everybody. I teach you the footwork which stimulates the meridians in the feet, which are just as necessary. And um, so I've released that. I've released the footwork and the yin-yang hands and the wood. So what has happened, if, you know, if you've noticed, if you've gone online, you have seen that um, the price is starting to go up. So I offered... Before I had even, to be honest, before I had even filmed the five elements and uh, the five element practices and, oops, is that what I, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, even before I had filmed the five elements, I'm going to get rid of that. Uh, and then let's bring back our old friend, Dr. Manhattan. Even before I filmed them, I uh, announced I'm going to teach the five element spirit fighting Kung Fu. I announced I was going to do it. And I went to uh, create this website, maoshan.thunderwizard.com. And if you went there just a couple of days ago, you saw that I was rolling it out and that I was uh, giving an $800 discount. And if you go to it now, you find that that $800 discount has now receded to $600. And that's because I already have the first uh, two videos, really three, but the first three videos up, which is the, uh, the introduction and the footwork set and the wood element. And then, of course, the explanation of those, of all of those. So the first of the five elements is up. And I've already finished the metal element, but I'm going to give it a few days before I put it up. But if you go there, you're going to see that every time I upload a new element, your price is going to go up. So if you're sitting on the fence going, gosh, I really want to do this, but it's expensive. I know it's expensive because what you're getting is you're getting 10 hours of my time one on one with you as well as the five elements and all of the other uh, things that I teach in them. So it's actually, you know, from my perspective, I'm giving away a lot of my time for a lot less money. But I do understand that it's a, it's a big one-time uh, purchase. But um, the longer you wait, the more expensive it's gonna get. So just letting you know. Now, what's really exciting to me about all this is that if you go to thunderwizard.com, and you sign up at the, uh, where is it? You sign up for the Lightning Qigong. There it is. 
you sign up for the Lightning Qigong, which is if you go to thunderwizard.com and you click around until you get to uh, Warrior 90 Day Lightning Qigong. Go there and subscribe there. That's a monthly subscription, and that will be the university. That's going to be the Maoshan University from here on out. That's where we're going to be doing all the Maoshan stuff. We're going to be at the Maoshan Temple, which that's the reconstructed Disneyland version in China. The real, the real monastery is non-existent, but they've, they've created a Disneyland there. If you want to go and see the Maoshan Disneyland, you can go see it. But so the uh, Maoshan Temple, for those of you who follow what I'm teaching, is going to be at the thunderwizard.com thunderwizard.com warrior 90 day so what's really exciting about this for me is that now that i have opened up this school for dr manhattans <laughs> now that i've opened this up and i'm teaching the the five element spirit fighting and we'll get to the other spirit fighting sets if there's you know if this continues to do as well as it is um, then there's no shortage of things I have to continue teaching you. So I'm going to be really be giving you a lot of in-depth information. You've been doing the 90-day stuff and you've been very patiently doing the practices that I've given you and you haven't seen a lot of me on the Thunder Wizard every you know couple of weeks or something I'll show up and I'll give another video or I'll give you know another phase. We're now on phase three of this which is the whole point of phase three was to get you ready for this stuff and this stuff uh, so now that all of that is in place now i can truly create my shaman school and um, the pinnacle of it is going to be this maosham uh, sorcerer Taoist practice so i'm very excited about that so uh, if you do become a spirit fighter and you do take the five element spirit fighting uh, apprenticeship course with me, if you do decide to do that, then it is going to be a requirement that you also uh, are subscribed here. And that's because uh, that's the only way to really get this thing. To, we're going to get so deep into this. So the Maoshan, you know, my experience of the Maoshan is that it is the, the most shamanic path I've ever seen, ever experienced. You know, and people already, if you're doing this, if you're already just doing this, you already know what I'm talking about. That just by doing the practices, that you bring into your reality this level of guidance that comes from the ascended masters so much so that if you're relaxed your body will start altering its you know it, its uh, its postures you'll your your movements will change slightly and that's because there's literally an ascended master that is almost like they're there sitting, uh, you know, standing behind you and placing your arms and changing just a slight, something slight with your fingers. And all of a sudden you feel this power flow through you. You are being instructed. And uh, this is a very dynamic path where if you get the basics of it and you get out of your own way, you will come up with your own forms. You will come up with your own practices you know I can't even begin to tell you what your spiritual power may be you know my teacher when he started doing this he found that he had healing powers that he was a body worker and the next thing he knew he was having dynamic powers and he you know has the, he had this power to heal people on a really power in a really powerful way you know I have things that have happened to me stuff that I I don't I don't flaunt the stuff I do flaunt, you see, that's one of the reasons why I'm able to go so deeply with people. That's why I'm able, when somebody comes and leaves a, a comment, I know exactly what it is that they're thinking and feeling. Because that's what comes to me when I do this stuff. Yours is going to be something else. I don't know what it's going to be. 
And uh, I have no interest in controlling you and have you sit down at my feet and worship me. None of that is happening here. We don't do that in this path. There are no gurus that we worship. We venerate our teachers and we venerate uh, those that have moved on and are in the realm of the immortals. And we, you know, if you want, you can put their picture on your altar. And if you become, you know, if you become an apprentice, I'll give you their pictures and you can put their pictures on your altar and you can ask for their guidance and all that. But that's all it is. We're asking for them to guide us to become like they were. And what happens to these guys when they, you know, when, when they become Dr. Manhattans and they're off in the uh, ethereal realm is that then the teaching doesn't stop. It's like, it's like they come and they say, look, now that we're these ascended masters, we see what we couldn't see before. So let me give you this other set. Here's this other form. No, now breathe like this. Now chant that. You know, you'll get intuitions. You'll get downloads of stuff that's never been taught before. You, there, you don't have to be the guy who just follows A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. You don't have to follow me. I'm not interested in that. If I give you any crap about, you know, have respect for your teacher or, you know, don't do this, it's disrespectful to me. It's not because I take it personally. I swear to you, I could care less. It's that you're sabotaging your own ability to learn and grow. That's all I care about. My goal is to get everybody here to become their own superhero. And when you have what you need and you no longer need my help, I will be the first one to wave goodbye and congratulate as you fly off to, you know, the Zeta Reticuli, whatever. Or you create your own path. Every single person that I've seen uh, that masters this ends up doing that. The, the Grand Master who brought these sets from southern China, you know, the, the, the first spirit fighting sets, uh, he, as I understand it, had channeled those sets because he learned, he first learned Shaolin Kung Fu and Shaolin energy work, and then he, and or simultaneously, he was a Maoshan sorcerer. And then he improved on it. And so he ended up creating these martial art forms that looked a lot like Shaolin, Southern Hakka style uh, Shaolin forms. But hidden in those forms were secret techniques to open up the lightning center that surrounds the heart. But you can't tell just by looking at them. It looks just like another martial art, another very typical Hakka martial art style. And then his, his student, who then, you know, when he passed away, then his student became the master. And then he created uh, and downloaded and channeled the five elements. And I don't even know if he even knew what he was doing. I knew that he channeled them. I knew that they were, they, you know, I came to the conclusion that these sets had to have been um, divinely inspired. He didn't just write them down and come up with them. He was stimulated because he had studied Xing Yi, which uses the five elements. And then that gave him the, the inspiration to create his own version of five element spirit fire. But what he may or may not have known is that each one of those elements stimulates a specific meridian that connects directly to the pericardium, which is the lightning. And so even within this lightning, there are five elements. And so each one of the five element sets that you're learning is stimulating a very specific meridian somewhere between the hand and the elbow. Somewhere between the hand and the elbow, there's, this, there's one of the five elements that's being stimulated. And you are getting lightning power of that element. And that's why when it's used in a martial way, you go up against the average martial artist, you slice through them like they don't exist. And, you know, as, as I has, has been my experience way back when, when I was you know, training in martial arts, you know, uh, your typical MMA guy would come up and want to trade hands with me. And I'd say, I, I, I don't do that. And they'd say, come on, man, you're into this Kung Fu stuff. Come on, man. And, and I'd say, all right, but I'm just telling you, I'm just going to touch you once. 
and it's going to be over. And I, uh, I said, all right, put, put them up. And I would do that. I would pick one of the elements and I would just tap them with one of the elements. And in <laughs> one guy, big guy, twice my size, you know, six foot, 250 pounds, MMA guy. <laughs> He, uh, as soon as I tapped him, his arm went numb, his face went completely white, and his eyes started filling up with tears and, he, and his lip quivered. And he said, no fair, you hit a nerve plexus. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff you're dealing with. Now, I'm not gonna be teaching you guys the martial arts, so don't get your hopes up. That is not at all what I'm interested in. Uh, the reason why the Grand Master created these sets was because in the 1920s in southern China and in the United States, which he came over to the United States when he was a young man at the beginning of the century, um, you got beat up, put in jail, picked on, killed, uh, even um, lynched if you were Chinese. So he took his spirituality and made it practical for him. He had to become a master martial artist. His, uh, his, um, uh, his student, that was still kind of true, so he was a master martial artist uh, because he had to protect himself. But you guys don't need that. That's not, we don't live in that same kind of world. Um, you want to protect yourself, you know, NRA will tell you to go buy, a, you know, an automatic rifle, right? So that's not what we need to do anymore. So what I'm doing is I'm taking these martial sets and I'm teaching you them and I'm reverse engineering and figuring out what I don't think the master or the grandmaster knew, which because they were channeling these, these forms, they might not have understood exactly what meridian they were dealing with. I do. And that's only because I've been practicing it for 30 years and I've been doing research and I've reverse engineered it and treated it like a science. And now I really appreciate it. These guys just weren't talented, you know, Qigong practitioners and martial artists. These guys were channeling directly from the, the Maoshan grandmasters who were teaching them different methods of becoming, you know, immortal, to becoming, achieving that kind of sorcerer enlightenment. All right? So this is the kind of stuff that uh, you're going to be a part of. Now, if you don't want to do this, you don't want to become a martial artist or play around with the martial arts sets, the spirit fighting sets, if you don't want to deal with that kind of Dr. Manhattan energy, I totally understand. I There were periods of time when I didn't practice it for years at a time because it felt like that. If you don't want to go through that and or that's not your thing and or you can't afford it right now, not a big deal because... If you just go to the thunderwizard.com and sign up as the uh, the warrior 90 day lightning qigong you will still learn this path you will still learn uh, in fact if you do the free qigong that i just put up the uh, awakening the immortals qigong that in and of itself will teach you the maoshan powers it will give you all of that okay and if you want to go to the elite level, if you want to become, you know, uh, a special forces uh, sorcerer, then you want to go to, to here eventually. All right? All right. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Again, to the best of your ability, try and keep your questions to the subject matter and to what I teach. And you will get a better response from me. So let's take a look and see what we got going on here. What else? Uh, background is too loud. I turned it down. Hopefully that fixed it. Chong the Viking says, question, why did the heads of martial arts schools thought that Mao Shan was evil? It wasn't just the heads of martial arts schools. Let me just check and see what the sound is like. Viking says, question, why did the heads of martial arts schools thought that Mao Shan was evil? It wasn't just the heads of martial arts schools. I could probably turn that music down a little bit more. Uh, it wasn't just the head of the martial arts schools. It was all of the other Taoist sects. So if you didn't watch, watch one of my most recent videos about this. But the Maoshan, 
the Maoshan were the first. This was the first uh, temple uh, mountain, uh, temple mountain that was created that was then turned into like this Taoist wizard university. This was about 2,000 years ago. Bear in mind, what's happening 2,000 years ago with the birth of the Maoshan Temple is that back into who knows 30,000 years, the first modern humans that show up in China, they develop for tens of thousands of years, they develop their form of shamanism. So that later becomes called Taoism because then the shamans start talking about following the Tao, which means the way, the unity, the balance, whatever word you want to use. They saw, they saw it from a shamanic perspective that everything was in dynamic balance and they sought the Tao, the flow of that dynamic balance. And they did whatever shamanic practice they had. They did channeling, they did divination, they did healing, they did herbs, they did meditation, they did uh, rituals, they did uh, mantras, they did whatever the hell they did. And so if you went to a, a shaman, you know, 10,000, 20,000 years ago, he might be, you know, he's going to have his bag of, of things that he needs for his people in his time period. So by the time the Mao Shan show up, you know, this, this Mao Shan temple, which Mao Shan just means Mao Mountain. So it was named after two guys, uh, the Mao brothers, and they uh, started this temple. They put it together and they started writing down all of their revelations and writing down these internal meditations and this energy work and these rituals. And they started codifying it. Uh, and it was a place to become an immortal. So the whole idea of, of Taoism you know, uh, traditionally, not not modern Taoism, which is let's read the Tao Te Ching. I got nothing against it, but let's read the Tao Te Ching and talk about, you know, whatever. Um, Taoism was, as I said, was this all-encompassing shamanic, uh, magical, shamanic path, practical, and so they started codifying it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and. Um, then they were the first to get um, royal patronage. So this was the beginning of the, the modern uh, Taoist period where you have all these Taoist mountains popping up. So there's a bunch of them. I don't know actually how many there are. There are five major ones. Ones you may have heard of. Mao Shan you might not have heard of, but it's, it is actually the most famous. Um, but then you've heard of Wu Dang Shan, so Wu Dang Mountain. Wu Dang is the one associated with martial arts. So uh, those are the guys, you know, Tai Chi is associated with that, Xin Yi, Bagua. Um, uh, so that's where you find internal, which means inside of China, created inside China, internal martial arts. Uh, Shaolin is something else that's Buddhist, but we won't get into that. So there's Wu Deng Shan and Hua Shan and Mao Shan and uh, I don't know, a bunch of others. So to answer your question is that they were always, the Mao Shan were always looked upon as the masters. And it was well known, these other mountains, because what would happen is people would go to Mao Shan and let's say it's like going to a university, right? So you would go to, um, you go to Yale. And at Yale, you learn mathematics. You know, somebody else goes and, you know, you get a general education, but your emphasis is on mathematics. Another guy goes and he studies and he becomes a doctor. So his is, you know, medical, medical school. So people would go to this mountain and they would learn Dao, the, the Tao. And they would, whatever their emphasis was, they would come off the mountain with that. And they would go start other mountains. And so that's why Wu Dang Shan is focused on martial arts. And some of the other ones are focused on divination. The other ones are focused on meditation. Others are focused on herbs. And, but they all have, you know, same things. And then they all go off in their own direction. So see what I mean? It's not like Catholicism. It's not like Catholicism. 
Now, where it's a specific religion. It's this, it's this collection of shamanic practices. And Mao Shan was the epitome of it. And they were all, everybody looked at them with respect. And these other guys from these other mountains would go to Mao Shan and they would learn more. So they would go on pilgrimages there and they'd learn and then they'd come back to their mountain and then they'd teach those guys what they learned. But the Mao Shan held on to some stuff, you know, some elite stuff. They were the, the special forces and they held on to some things that they didn't necessarily share with everybody. It's very typical in Chinese uh, teaching where there will be what's called the outer court tradition and then the inner court. So the outer court is everybody comes and learns that and then there's the if they decide to, to make you an inner door student that means the master has said okay you you come inside with me and then they go inside and close the door and then they you know he teaches them all right so out there you learned this 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 and this but here's where we're going to shift that and change that and add this and take this away and then he would be under strict uh, orders now you don't share this with anybody not without my permission and then he'd go out and he'd be this special forces guy and he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't share with anybody and he would be treated with that kind of respect. So these guys, these Mao Shan guys were treated with that kind of respect everywhere that they went. But it became necessary in order to survive as a monastery, it became necessary to get patronage from whoever was, you know, running the country at the time. Because every, you know, every few hundred years, whoever became emperor would wipe out all of the Taoist monasteries and wipe out all of the Buddhist monasteries. And then they'd have to run for cover and then come back and, you know, start from scratch. Right? So um, it became important to compete. And so the different mountains started competing to say, we're the best. No, we're the best. No, we're the most real. No, we're... Now, nobody could compete with the Mao Shan power. They couldn't. I mean, you've, no, none of them had the guts to say, oh, we're more powerful than those Mao Shan guys. None of them had that, <laughs> were that stupid. So instead, they started calling Mao Shan evil. And they started saying, yeah, those Mao Shan guys, they practice sorcery. They, they worship demons. And that's not true, because whenever those guys, whenever those other mountains had problems with demons or curses or black magic, they would guess where they would run. They would send somebody running to the Mao Shan temple saying, hey, can you come to Wu Dang Shan and get rid of the evil curse? And then the, the you know, some special forces guys from Mao Shan would go over there and they would do their thing, whatever that was. And they would drive away the, the evil spirits and the guys would say, thank you very much. And they would give them tribute. And then they, these guys would go back to their temple in Mao Shan. And then as soon as uh, they were out of sight, then Wu Dang Shan or whatever would start going, yeah, those Mao Shan guys are so evil. They take demons in and demons jump inside your body. And so to answer your question, that's the first part. The second part of your question is that in modern times, um, what started happening was that it became more and more difficult as time went on to actually keep these mountains going because every, like I said, every couple hundred years, some emperor would come along and he would, uh, he would destroy, he would kill all the priests, you know, because he was afraid of their power. And so what ended up happening is the Mao Shan guys had to go into hiding. So they, they, uh, there was another thing, there was a big shift that happened where the the people who now call themselves Hakka used to be the uh, I forget what they called themselves but they were the dominant race in China and these were the guys who were you know who were running the country the emperors and such and these other guys came along the Mandarin guys came along and got rid of them I think it was the Mandarin got rid of them and um, you know then they started hunting down everybody of that race. So they started hunting down all the people, the, the ethnicity that used to were dominant in the country. They, they would hunt them all down. They would hunt down all of the elites. So all of the people who used to be the elites, which would also include all of the high level priests and magicians and Mao Shan sorcerers, all these guys went running to southern China, which was mountains. And it was the Wild West. And so they 
You know, that's why Southern martial arts are so different now. If you see what I'm doing over here, it's all very tightly compact. There's no big sweeping movements. There's no jumping kicks. It's because these guys had to learn how to fight on goat pads in mountains. And they learned how to be even more devastating, you know, and more practical. So, you know, like uh, one of my, I have a friend of mine who's a uh, uh, fifth degree jujitsu black belt and trained in all kinds of stuff. And he trains people for the octagon, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, I would hate to be trapped in, um, in an elevator with you. Because he knew that if he, get, if he got into my range, which is very short, that I'd tear him apart. Because he needs distance. He either needs distance to punch or kick, or he needs to grab me and take me to the ground. If he can't do those things, he knew that I would tear him apart. Because I'm so good in close. And that comes from you know, that thing. Because in southern China, if you want to be able to fight, you got to be able to fight on a goat path or, you know, on a boat in a, in a, on a river or, you know, you're um, walking on some rocks, you know, in a rushing river. And you're going to have to be able to fight a guy there without having to do a lot of big movement. Uh, so these guys, these Maoshan guys, had to go to southern China. So along the way, again, things were so harsh. They had to go up against bandits. They had to go up against their next door neighbor who was a farmer and wanted, you know, there was, there's limited amount of, of uh, land to farm on. Uh, they had to go up against the uh, governmental forces that would come in every now and then and try to clean the place out. You know, there were mercenaries. It was just the Wild West. And uh, so these guys started learning and focusing on what they knew how to do, which would be called sorcery or black magic. So they learned how to take demons captive. They learned how to then send curses to people. They learned how to do all kinds of stuff, which is now associated with black magic. So now there's some truth. When somebody uh, starts talking about Mao Shan as being uh, black magic, there's truth to it. I don't do that. My teachers didn't do that. I, I think the guy who originally brought it may have known how to do that, but he chose you know, he chose to teach, you know, stuff that was necessary, which now it's not necessary to do that. But what he did teach was how to fight demons. So that's one thing that if you practice this, this whole focus of the lightning energy is the energy that you use to fight against demons. You can fight against them with your bare hands. If you know how to practice this well enough, you can go into a into a haunted house and do those sets and they'll drive them away. Or you can use it with your energy, you can use it with your chanting, you can do it with rituals, it doesn't matter. You bring that lightning energy with you wherever you go. So the one thing that is still true about the Mao Shan, even if they're, they're not uh, black magicians, is that they do have just an energy that destroys negativity. Which is why, again, when we go back to the five element model here, no, oh, not that one, when we go back to the five element cycle, this is why we do the controlling cycle, where uh, wood is destroyed by metal, metal is destroyed by fire, fire is destroyed by water, water is destroyed by earth, and then earth is destroyed by wood. Because that is self, the ruthless self-honesty. And when you mirror that onto uh, an evil being, whether that be in the flesh or out of the flesh, they have to run. They can't tolerate it. So to answer your question, I, hopefully I answered your question there. Why did other martial arts schools see it that way? It wasn't just martial arts schools. It was all other Taoists. Um, okay, what else? Zach Johnson, my favorite teacher who yells at me is back. Yeah, well, you know, don't take it so personally. You're not the only one that gets yelled at. <laughs> I take that ruthless honesty and I, I give it to other people as well. Uh, let's see. So Zach asked people to follow him on Instagram. So uh, uh, YouTube automatically will delete that. And that's not what my channel is for. So I'd appreciate it if you didn't do that. I'm already promoting myself on this channel. You can promote yourself on your own. So I, I'm not going to show that. Vincent.thunderwizard.com is one of my students. He's also one of my, my Mao Shan students uh, as well. 
But he, uh, if you go to his website, vincent.thunderwizard.com, you can get uh, a Vedic astrological reading. I have trained him in that, so go check it out. All right. Zach Johnson. Zach, are you a guy? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm heterosexual, so if you're a guy, I don't marry. But even if you were a woman, um, I've been with a BPD and... Um, so no, I don't, I don't have any intentions of doing that again, but uh, I'm glad you're on my channel and I hope it helps you. Patrick Neal, what's the realm of the immortals? Patrick, is that really that hard to figure out? What do you mean, what is the realm of the immortals? It's, it's not, the, the immortals have moved beyond this physical three-dimensional reality. So how does that, how does that question help you? I mean, we, you and I, you know, I, you know about as much as I do. <laughs> it's that the level of vibration is such that it's not part of this three-dimensional reality. That's all I can tell you. Um, wow, Vincent says, my recent blood test results show a dramatic increase in testosterone. I think he's had some, uh, some health issues. I'm even starting to get facial hair. I had low T just a few months ago. I'm assuming, unless you've taken other kinds of uh, medication, that you're saying that the thunderwizard.com, the lightning qigong, has uh, helped you. I think if that's the case, if what you're saying is true, uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, not that you would lie to me, I don't think you're lying to me, but if I'm hearing you correctly, then what you're saying is that what I think is happening is that your self-directed negativity, which was one of the main, if not the main, reasons for your ill health. That um, you've been healing on that level. So you've been learning to love yourself and accept yourself while at the same time acknowledging and having that ruthless self-honesty to look at your own agendas and attachments. And, and that is going to get the five organs moving again. You know, even just doing working with the five element uh, meditations that I teach you at thunderwizard.com, lightning qigong, even that will start the body producing the testosterone and uh, all the other good stuff that it needs. So um, that's what I'm seeing in that. Again, I don't know if you're taking other medications or whatever, but even so, even if you are, I still think I agree with you. I still think it's helping. Patrick Neal, who are you talking to? Why aren't you, why aren't you asking me? I'm right here. <laughs> you can ask me that question. You don't have to, have to sort of throw it out and see where it lands. He says, I found this channel and Thunder Wizard talked about reincarnation when I was looking on YouTube. Wish he could say more of what he was talking about. Well, it's good if you use punctuation and good sentence structure, you know, so I, I you know, you sound... Uh, complete with your thoughts. So you want me to talk more about reincarnation? All right, so Patrick Neal, here's how this works. You go on to YouTube, and in the YouTube uh, search, you type in Thunder Wizard. Up will come my channel. You will see my channel. It says thunderwizard.com, thunderwizard, D-O-T-C-M. You'll see me there. You'll see my channel page. You then go, depending on what you're using, whether it's a phone or an iPad, or if you're using a laptop like me, you go down below where the menu is, and you'll see videos and about, and then you'll see a little uh, magnifying glass, or depending on somewhere, there's going to be a drop-down menu that will give you a search bar. So either click on that or click on the search bar and type in reincarnation. I have got to have at least 20 hours of me talking about reincarnation. I talk about it all the time. So Patrick, my friend, put the time and effort into it. Okay? And you can have what you want. Say, so what else? Um, it says, if it's real, teach it. Yeah, I am teaching it. Um... Patrick Neal, so I become a pat Patreon for $25 and I learn Kung Fu? No. $25 gets you at the mastery of shaman level. So if you, again, here's the two most important things in life, my friend, and I think 
you'll do well by implementing. Number one, pay attention. Number two, put effort. So when you go to thunderwizard.com, you will see multiple levels. So the Lightning Qigong, the Warrior 90 Day Lightning Qigong, which is a level above that, a couple of levels above that, you will get the, the Maoshan University. The Spirit Fighting, you have to go to maoshan.thunderwizard.com. Now again, if you pay attention and put effort, you would have clicked on that link and you would know that that's a totally different thing. So my friend, I'm glad I can educate you on how to best use your YouTube channel and best use my channel. Um, and I hope that answers your question. I'm sure you're not the only one who's got that question. Chong the Viking has thrown down $10. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Nick PH has thrown down $20. Wow. Congratu uh, congratulations to me. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I appreciate all of the... Uh, support you guys give this channel. The more you support me and whatever it is, the more time I'm going to spend doing this stuff. And now I am so jazzed and so revved up about this. Because I, you know, I was kind of wondering, you know, how, how, what more can I teach these guys? And now I have opened it up and there's no shortage of stuff because we're going to really need to get really serious. And I'm going to be teaching you things about different energies and the different in the fingers you know how to use the how to really get into the magic i'm going to be showing you stuff that's been downloaded to me new forms new techniques that i mean it's gonna if you think you've <laughs> if you think you've experienced power yet you haven't even begun to experience where we're going to go so this is uh this is going to be a new maoshan tradition you know of course it's different I'm different. It's a different time. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, things are a little different now. Obviously, it's not going to be the same, but it's evolving and morphing into its own new path. But it's still the same power is still there. Let's see, Ra Damsi Music question. I feel guilty for not being financially successful. How can I forgive myself? It's a great question. Let me save you some time. Don't waste time trying to forgive yourself. It's, that's meaningless. Uh, the recipe that you're asking for, I understand it. What you want is you, your, your assumption is if I'm not guilty, if I don't have these negative feelings, I will be financially successful and that's not how it works. So first off, stop trying to change your feelings. Your feelings are not what's causing you to be uh, poor. Your feelings have little or nothing to do with it. Your guilt is actually anger. Guilt is anger. Anybody listening to me, whenever you feel guilty, you're full of homicidal rage. But you're turning that rage on yourself. So even that, knowledge won't save you. Here's what you do. Radamzi Music, go on to my free YouTube channel and look for, I already have told you how to search. Go and search for the Shaman Nick secret command meant to a perfect life i've got videos on this channel i have a book it's a cheap book you can go on to, to amazon and buy it that's probably the most important book that i have if you master what is in that little book you will never worry about finances ever again don't get me wrong, you'll have to work, there might be some ups and downs, but the idea is that your, uh, your guilt is, has nothing to do with either you being poor or you being rich. What, the reason why you are not financially successful is one thing and one thing only. That is you are not following your soul, which will tell you what your joy is. Here's how things have been created. You have been programmed out of it because if whatever society you live in can program you out of it, then you can become a peon and then you can work for minimum wage or an hourly wage or you can be part of the machine. And so the guilt, among other things, there's probably some uh, unresolved childhood stuff, which I don't have time to get into, but 
among that is you, in order to feel like a good person, you need to go out and do this and do that. And some people honestly do not feel like they have any value if they're not working really hard. How do I know this? Because I feel this way. I still feel this way. Um, the other day I worked with clients. I had three clients that day. So I had three hours back to back counseling um, apprenticeship clients. I then went and, um, and then did my did some stuff for myself and I went to an online group for myself for two and a half hours or something like that. And then I went and I videotaped for an hour and then I came back and I edited for two and a half hours and then I uploaded to YouTube and I made a couple of websites and after all of that, I was sitting there feeling like I was a loser. Like, oh my God, I'm so lazy. I haven't done anything all day. And the only reason I felt that way was because none of it was work for me. It was fun. I enjoyed every minute of it. And I made a lot of money that day. And I invested in stuff that, that's making me a lot of money. And, but I still felt like I was, I was lazy and I wasn't, and I had to stop myself and I said, wait a, wait a second, Mike, you've just spent probably six, seven hours of your time and you did all this work. You, you, there are people saying, thank you. Without you, I'd be dead. Thank you for helping me. You just made XXX amount of money and you're feeling like a loser. It's because I didn't put on a tie and sit in a cubicle and type uh, on some crappy you know, um, you know, cheap computer at some office somewhere. That's how I was trained. I was trained if I'm going to be, you know, worth anything, that's what I have to do. And I hate that. I hate doing that. I hate it more than anything. And so your guilt isn't about being financially successful. Your guilt is that you don't think that you're a good person. You don't believe that you have any value, that you are, you are without value unless you say financially successful. So the thing is, you really don't believe that you need to be financially successful because if you did, you would be financially successful. What you believe is that you're supposed to be poor and you're supposed to feel guilty about it. How you learned that, I don't know. I would need to talk to you to be able to figure out that came from your mom or your dad or your, I don't know where it came from. But somebody told you that, listen, Radamsey Music, your worth is in being poor. But when you are poor, you need to feel crappy. So I'm going to make you feel crappy. Oh my God, you're never going to make it. You're such a loser. Why are you music? Why are you wasting time being a musician? That doesn't accomplish anything. Why don't you do something for real? But then the underlying message is, oh, uh, to your unconscious, the message is, oh, by the way, I don't really want you to be successful because if you are, you'll make me look bad. And if you make me look bad, you'll be killing me and I'm your parent. So even though I abuse you and make you feel like shit, your first, uh, your, your first commitment is to me. So you need to be a fuck up and a loser and poor so that I won't feel bad. All right, now back to the, what we pretend to do. Uh, why can't you get up off your ass, Radamsey Music, and go start making more money? Because, you know, what is this waste of time with the music? Well, if the music was anything, why aren't you making any money? At you are poor because you're trying to be of value to something or somebody. Now, that, what I just told you, won't save you either. There's only one thing that will. You listen to your soul. If your soul tells you that what gives you joy is making music, then that's what you do. And you say to yourself, I am going to make not just any music. I'm going to make my music. And I'm going to make my music and I don't care if nobody gets it. I'm going to create the music that makes me weep and makes me come in my pants. I'm going to make that thing that makes me so happy. Even if, even if I live in a box, in a cardboard box, that's what I'm going to do. If it kills me, that's what I'm going to do. If you have that commitment, you will succeed. 
Because what you don't understand, Radamzi Music, is that your soul came here. I'm assuming music is your soul desire. Maybe it isn't. But I'm assuming it is. If it is, your soul came here saying, I want to be a musician. That's the whole reason I incarnated. So whenever you're not doing your thing or you sabotage your career, you don't make, you, you make the video of the Christmas jingles that you think might sell instead of making that really off the wall, uh, uh, progressive, strange thing that only you get, that you love, but nobody else seems to understand. You know, when you make the crappy music to fit in and try and make a career for yourself, you hate yourself and you sabotage yourself. How do I know that? Because I did it. I was an actor. I had a theater in Hollywood. That theater company is still alive 30 years later, even though they don't, they don't realize I founded it. I co-founded a theater company in Hollywood 30 years ago. I also started doing stand-up comedy. I went, to, uh, I went to the comedy store and I saw Robin Williams and a bunch of others and I said to myself, that's so easy. And I was, I was, I was you know, bad-mouthing him and I stopped myself and I said, wait, I should go do it first. So I did. And I started winning comedy contests and I could have gone to Vegas and I, I sabotaged it. I sabotaged my acting career. For that same reason, everything I said about you was true about me. Now, as it turns out, that's not my thing anymore. It's not what makes me happy anymore. Um, so you're not financially successful because you feel guilty. And forgiving yourself won't fix it. How do I know that? Um, I just rolled out this new thing and some money has come to me. And I felt guilty. I looked at the amount of money that was coming into my PayPal and I felt guilty. So get over this idea, everybody listening to me, get over this idea that your feelings are what's important. If you, if you uh, listen to the impulse and you act on the impulses of the feelings, if they're negative, yeah, that's bad. But your actions do not have to be fueled by your emotions. The joy that I talk about, when you become aware of your joy, it'll be a flash. Like, you know, Dr. Manhattan over here. It'll be a flash of joy. And then your unconscious will step in and go, but you can't make any money doing that. But that's not, no, that's stupid. That's, that's a waste of time. The, you have to be part of society. That doesn't help society. And then you start doing things like, well, you know, maybe if I did parties for kids and I played music, at least I wouldn't hate it that much. Maybe, maybe if I wrote jingles for television commercials, maybe I wouldn't hate music. And then, then I could do my music in my spare time. How do I know? Because I did it. So I know exactly how that feels. He says, I'm content with less, but I feel like I should have more. No, you're not. Who are you bullshitting? You're content with less? So what, because you're not starving to death? Come on, get rid of the false humility. You're not, you're not impressing anybody with that. I don't give a crap if you have a, you know, a mansion or if you live in a one bedroom apartment. I don't care, I've had both and I've been happy in both. And it's not about that, it's not about having less or having more. There's nothing spiritual about being miserable. There's nothing spiritual about having, you know, 10 Rolls Royces and, and huge mansions either. It's having what you want. So you say you feel like you should have more? Get the hell out of your head. What do you want? Anyway, read that book. You'll know what I'm talking about. Jameson Colliday, question. What is a healthy way to conceptualize the desire for power? Why do you guys have to do this? Why do you have, I mean, don't get me, I'm asking these rhetorical questions because I know the answer, but why do you have to conceptualize it? I mean, what's, I mean, when you want to eat, when you want to eat food and you're hungry, is there a spiritual hunger for food? And then is there a not so spiritual hunger? I mean, you want to eat, you're hungry. Even if you're a vegetarian, you're going to have a veggie pizza. 
You're going to have a veggie pizza and you're starving and you are going to eat that thing and you're going to swallow it. It's going to go in your stomach and make you, I'm getting hungry talking about it. You're going to make yourself feel better. So why is that okay? I and mean, you have to go take a dump. All right. Is there like I have to go spiritually dump or no? And then that you, you mean you were enjoying the dump? What the hell's wrong with you? That dumping is gross and disgusting. You made love to your wife. Oh, my God. Were you lusting after her? That's not spiritual. Come on. Let's drop all of this religious garbage bullshit. Let's drop it. If you have a desire for power, you have a desire for power. There's nothing healthy or unhealthy. It's just a desire. I'm going to share something. You know, um, the desire for love. Is that healthy or unhealthy? I'll just, you know, you don't have to write it down. Just answer the question to yourself. Is the desire for love and companionship healthy or unhealthy? All right. Now log in your answer. Now, um, two scenarios. One scenario. A, a Buddhist priest who spends his whole life living the Dharma and giving to others. And he starts this uh, this ashram where they feed the poor and they get water to the, the, the village and they, they get the plants happy again and the animals happy and whatever and they create this sanctuary and it's wonderful and this guy says to himself I do I achieved this because of my celibate devotion to the Dharma and then this beautiful nun Buddhist nun comes along and works with him and they fall in love. And they're both highly spiritually advanced people and they start to really want to be and they start to want to have a family and they decide to give up their vows and their celibacy and they marry each other and they they create the most beautiful heaven on earth. Is their desire for love and companionship right in your own box? Is this healthy or unhealthy? All right, so what is we're talking about is the desire for love and attachment. They took conscious action towards what they wanted. Now, Jeffrey Dahmer. If you know anything about Jeffrey Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer didn't sit around in his apartment going, I'm going to find people to kill and eat. He didn't do that. He went out to clubs and bars and whatever, and he'd meet people people. He he was homosexual and he'd meet young men that he was attracted to and they would hit it off and he would invite them back to his apartment and they would have wine and cheese and whatever and they would talk and then that person would get up to go home and Jeffrey Dahmer would then because his desire for love and affection became so intense and the fear of being abandoned would become so intense that he would then smack him over the head with a hammer and kill him, chop him up, have sex with him and eat them. The desire was the same in both people. It's not the desire that is unhealthy. It is the action. You could feel like Jeffrey Dahmer and act like the Buddhist monk. And people will thank you for acting like a Buddhist monk. People don't sit around wondering what your intentions are. Oh, so you mean you, mean you, you gave me this beautiful birthday dinner and you cooked for me and you, you gave me these presents. And I'm finding out now that what was going on inside your mind was that you hated doing it because why wasn't somebody giving you a present? I can't stand you. They would say, oh, my God, even with that feeling, you did all that for me. Thank you. You're such a good person. They would love you for what you did. That's what's important. It's not what you feel. It's what you do. The narcissism is in thinking that your intentions mean something. And the reason why Jeffrey Dahmer did what he did and the reason why you and I on our lesser scale of horrific narcissism, even why we worry about our intentions is because at some point, Jeffrey Dahmer and you were taught that your worth 
is based upon not only what you do, but every feeling you have. If you don't love me, mom, dad, God, the universe, you know, if you don't love me right now, like, like Jehovah says, you love the Lord your God with all your soul, your heart, and your mind, that is narcissism. So the narcissist says, not only do you have to do everything that I want, but you have to feel everything that I want. And if you're not feeling what I want you to feel, you are bad, you're worthless, you're evil. And so your question is coming from that. You want to have a healthy desire for power. I don't care what you're, you have a desire for power. Listen to your soul and go after it. You know, how, how else does somebody run an ashram that heals the world. I mean, somebody has to take authority. Somebody has to have the power. I don't know what your, your desire for power is or isn't. Okay, have I made, made my point? The only difference between Jeffrey Dahmer and the, the Buddhist monk is that Jeffrey Dahmer was not capable of tolerating his feelings. He didn't have the ability to love himself through his fear of, oh my God, this guy I've just met who I'm falling in love with is now is going to go home for six hours. He's, the guy can get up and say, hey, Jeffrey Dahmer, it was really great meeting you. I, I really like you. Let's meet for brunch tomorrow. Jeffrey Dahmer can't tolerate the thought of the guy leaving and he can't tolerate that he can't tolerate it. So he has to kill the feeling. And in his mind, that guy is the cause of his feeling. So he killed that guy. So that he wouldn't have to feel lonely and abandoned and judge himself for feeling lonely and abandoned. The difference is the Buddhist monk, when he meets the other nun and they talk and she says to him, wow, I, I'm feeling totally attracted to you and, and I don't know if I'm comfortable with it. I'm, I'm going to go back to, to my village and meditate on it. The Buddhist monk says, I understand. I will miss you horrifically. And the thought of you leaving is is very sad and uh, makes me feel very alone. But I'm, I so much appreciate you that the thought of you being happy is, makes me happy. And so I have the ability to tolerate my own feelings. I will see you when I see you. Which makes her go back home and she goes, oh my gosh, he just loves me for who I am. I need to be with him. And then the next day she shows up with her bags and says, that's it, let's get married. That's the difference. The difference is one couldn't tolerate their own feelings and had to judge themselves for their feelings. And the other person loved themselves and didn't judge themselves for feeling sad or alone or desirous. So stop judging your feelings. Stop judging your desires. That's somebody else. Somebody else living in your head. And the ironic thing is, is that the person judging you, telling you not to have those feelings is going to force you to go have them. You know, it's one of the interesting things that you see in societies where there's no prostitution, there's no pornography, guess what you see? You see a lot of sexual assaults. In societies where you have prostitution and pornography, you have people accepting their own sexual feelings and you have a lot less sexual assaults. The, the feeling is the same. It's lust. But when you're guilted out of it, you're not supposed to lust, guess what happens? It becomes it becomes bottled up and it becomes so intense that people feel so guilty and then they end up acting out on that impulse and they can't control themselves. Uh, who is the Jimmy Swagger? Maybe I'm, I, I'm too old, you don't remember Jimmy Swagger. I remember Jimmy Swagger. When I was a Christian, uh, I really looked up to him and he used to rail on pornography and uh, infidelity and uh, sex before marriage and he would rail and he would beat the Bible against his hand and he would shake his finger and guess what this guy was screwing hookers street hookers crack whores and then he got caught and the very famous meme if you go you know type in Jimmy Swagger crying you can go on YouTube right now You'll see him in his church, his mega church with all of his followers and his family in the front row. And as his, he cried all the time, I have sinned against you. It's because he didn't tolerate his own sexual feelings. Instead of having and loving himself through his own sexual feelings and then 
experiencing that with his wife, who I'm sure would have loved to dress up like a hooker for him if that's what he wanted. It all comes down to not loving yourself. If you don't love yourself, you're going to hurt other people. Guaranteed. So all of the false humility out there, of people saying, I can live with less and, uh, I, uh, and I don't need to have that and that's an unhealthy desire and uh, uh, you know, you're going to end up being passive aggressive and at the very least, you're going to be passive aggressive and hurt other people. At the worst, the impulse is going to be overwhelming and you're going to act on it in a destructive way that hurts somebody else and then you're going to hate yourself even more. So just be yourself. Listen to what your soul wants. All right, what else? Uh, you've said many times dying to your parents and their expectations of you. I want to train to be empowered and fight for the innocent. Fight for yourself first. That, that desire to fight for the innocent is a very noble thing. If, if you can first identify that that's your projection. If you're conscious of it, that that's your projection and you're healing yourself while you do it, that's great. But fighting for the innocent is not going to save you from your self-hatred. It's you, when you fight for the innocent, what you're saying is you want somebody to fight for you. And be honest about that. I want somebody to fight for me. Well, maybe somebody won't fight for you, so you got to fight for yourself. You have to parent yourself. Your mom wasn't there to fight for you, so you got to fight for yourself. Same with me. My mom didn't protect me against my, my abusive narcissistic brother. I had to learn how to heal myself. So the 12 steps, I know you're doing that. This, is, this will take care of all that stuff if you keep doing it. James Colliday question is, is that just wanting to save my past self and therefore just trying to appease my parents? Um, perhaps, but at the very least, it's a projection. You're wanting to save yourself. But instead of actually going in and doing the work of saving yourself, it's a distraction. So you're going to save others. Then the narcissism kicks in and you are looking down and you're helping the innocent. Well, you have to first help yourself, then you can help the innocent. And then you can do it without, without, uh, without looking down on them. Then you can see them as yourself. I mean, all the stuff I tell you guys... It, you know, even though, you know, that's my style, I may be shaking my finger and asking you rhetorical questions like, why the hell are you doing that to yourself? That's because I've done it. So I've done it and I've had some healing in that area so I can talk from that. But I'm not looking down on you. I see myself in all of you. You may not, maybe, maybe I don't, I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't tell you that, but I do. I see myself in all of you. I'm not, I'm not, if I, the message that I try and give is, listen, if I can do it, you can do it. And this is what happens with me. I don't, I haven't gotten to the place where I'm free of my guilt. I mean, I have guilt whether I'm financially successful or poor. So I might as well enjoy the guilt and be, and be financially successful. <laughs> see, I didn't even use the word rich. I just stopped myself. I didn't even say the word rich because it's, yeah, I, I would have to I would have to change my feelings about that or I would have to change my judgments about that. My feelings are going to be whatever they're going to be. All right. What else? Vincent.thunderwizard.com. Honest feeling. So uh, in case you're new to my channel, the two things that I like is that people give me honest questions or honest feelings. When you start touting your opinion, you put a target on your head because I'm going to take apart the fallacious thinking because you're not the only person thinking that. It's not that I'm singling you out to humiliate you. It's that, oh, look, that person is having that, that fallacious thinking that all the rest of us have. Here, let me, let me use you as an example. So the way to avoid that is to ask an honest question or an honest feeling. And even then, even then I can't guarantee I won't psychoanalyze you. All right, what else? I'm frustrated by my limitations as a visually impaired man. I can understand that. I feel for you. I'm unable to have the full autonomy that I'd like and be able to do the activities that I'd like to do on my own when I want. Thank you for uh, your bravery in sharing that. Thank you for sharing your vulnerability. We all have limitations. And uh, so I understand that. So I'm not even going to try and talk you out of that. I'm just going to sit with you in that feeling because that must be really sad and frustrating and, and um, 
So I feel for you. Um, what else? Chong the Viking. Question, how would I go about purchasing a one-on-one -on -one consultation with you? Chong the Viking. Two most important things in life are pay attention and put effort. So if you've been on my channel, you've seen me tell you and you've seen on behind me, you've seen this link, courses.thunderwizard.com. If you go there, you will find everything. If you want to have a private session, um, you can uh, become an apprentice and work with me. Uh, I think now I'm only taking twice a week, so you can go to thunderwizard.com and at that level of apprenticeship if you want that, but you have to commit to long-term. If you just want a one-on-one -on -one session with me, then you go to career.thunderwizard.com. Scroll to the bottom of the page and purchase a session. That will give you a one-time session with me. What else? Let's see. Uh, question. How would I go? Okay. Radham's in music. I love music and I do music all day if I can, but I don't have much money. Right. So, so again, I'm assuming, because I was an actor for years. I was an actor for years. I was a comedian. Um, and I obviously didn't, as you can tell, I did not make it as an actor. And it's still, I still have bouts of jealousy and, uh, and, and resentment about that. Um, there are still times when I see, you know, movies I should have been in or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then when I think about it and I go, well, so what's stopping you? Why don't you go do something about it now? You, know, you can move back to Hollywood and do that actor thing. And then I go, oh my God, I don't want to do that again. So um, it's obvious that I don't want it. What I want is what I have. What I have, what I want, is I want to live, well, I want to live right where I live, but I want to live in a place that's semi-tropical, that is in the forest, that is on empty beaches that go for miles, in a place where people speak English and there's uh, first world amenities like grocery stores and cell phones and all of that and uh, um, I want to live in a house in the forest right on the beach and I have that and uh, it's something that I would not have been able to afford three four years ago that's what I want this business funds what I want it ha also happens to be something I really enjoy. So I really love doing it as well. But, you know, if you say music is, you do music all the time, all day if you can, great. Why aren't you turning that into money? If you're doing music all day and you are uh, obviously skilled and talented and it is your joy, then the reason you're not making money is because you, on an unconscious level, are sabotaging your success. I don't know what that would be. I would, you might not, you probably don't. You're not aware of that. But you have a conflict because if you didn't, you wouldn't be complaining about being poor. And, you know, the idea that musicians can't make money is just bullshit. Tell that to... Um, Billy Eilish. Tell that to Michael Jackson. Didn't 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 ultimately make Michael Jackson happy. He ended up killing himself over his fill in the blank. So Radamzi music, assuming that your music is your joy, you're in conflict. What you feel guilty about is the music. There's some part of you that feels unworthy to, to be a musician, and so you sabotage yourself so you can stay poor. So you can keep beating yourself up and feeling bad and then struggle with, like you said, doing music all day, if I can. You can. And you can make money doing it, especially now. There's no shortage of ways to promote yourself as a musician. There's no shortage of ways that you can use music. You know, uh, everybody, I recommend everybody watch Arnold Schwarzenegger's on YouTube. He's got, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you look for it, you'll find his speech on, you know, success. 
and he talks about failure and he talks about being this you know this this goofy kid in in Austria and and at the time wanting to be a bodybuilder which was which was weird you have to understand that being a bodybuilder back in the 50s and 60s was weird only weird screwed up people did that in fact i remember there was a i think it was um, streets of san francisco with arnold schwarzenegger was in it and and this woman was laughing at him when he took his shirt off and he was flexing this woman started laughing at him and then you know his character got upset and started destroying things like the hulk but that was accurate people would you would laugh at that it was weird to want to be a bodybuilder movie star and to be talking like this and not be able to understand that and i mean he was just he was just he was just such a geeky weird strange sort of like zombie creature thing and look at him now and he talks about how much he failed he failed a lot much more than he succeeded and he says that about everybody doesn't matter who you are you know my, michael jordan missed more uh missed more baskets than he made so you know if you're doing what you love and you're not making money there's only one person to blame you are sabotaging yourself it means that you have a conflict so instead of feeling guilty like you're a screw up rodhams in music the point is is that on an unconscious level you have judged yourself that being a musician is not a valid living and so you're doing it to yourself again i'd have to talk with you to find out more but what else uh let's see regarding my health i am taking thyroid medication okay so you're not doing anything you're not taking any testosterone so that's really huge so the self-directed negativity was actually depressing your your body your glandular system so your glands weren't functioning and um so doing the according to you if we're correct what you're saying is that doing the the 90 day um uh, lightning qigong has restarted your glandular system and has helped you uh regain some of your health so uh, that's awesome i'm really happy to hear that and it just means bottom line you're happy happiness will do that you know self-directed negativity and depression and sadness will i mean it depresses everything so that's why i say you know what's the most spiritual thing anybody can do is come to be aware of what they truly want and go do it even if they have all kinds of unconscious conflict and if your parents and society and god and the universe are all against you you do it anyway because your happiness is more important than anything else in the world and the best way to help others is first show them by example how to be happy and successful it's not by carrying your cross and humbling yourself and oh i just am interested in love and light and i just oh, oh i just all right what else Vincent D says I've been working on my self-hatred issues and feel much more accepting of myself now. I'm very happy to hear that. Lightning Qigong has been a huge help. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm I'm honestly honored and happy to hear that just sharing something that that is just has that makes me happy. Just sharing what I've done for myself has been helpful to others. I have a, I feel very gratified by that. Ding Shaylak honest feeling i want to become a lightning qigong teacher in my country but i'm worried that i won't be accepted without being certified by the austrian qigong society even though i am channel i understand that i didn't teach this for th- publicly for 30 years i taught i had classes i was an assistant instructor with my instructor until he got uh, upset with me and then ghosted me um and publicly humiliated me he tried to destroy my my reputation publicly um and i kept it hidden until now um for that same reason uh so you want to teach 
uh, Lightning Qigong, go right ahead. You have my permission. I mean, the, here's the reality of it. Once you give something to somebody, they can do whatever they want. You can't stop them. Now, I haven't certified you. I'm still considering creating a certification course for this stuff at some point, but, but it doesn't change the fact if you want to go teach somebody, it's not a damn thing I can do. I, you know, I'd have to get on a plane and fly to Austria, and even then, what am I going to do? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, I totally understand where you're coming from. So they have an Austrian Qigong society. Well, I mean, I got nothing against the Austrian Qigong society, but they, they can't stop you from learning or teaching anybody anything anyway. Um, so, yeah. But the thing is, I'm quite certain that they don't know Lightning Qigong. They don't know the Jing Qi to Shen pathway. So they couldn't certify you in something they don't even know exists. I'm sure they don't even know exists. So how can they certify you? Anyway, but I appreciate what you're saying. Jedi Black Knight question. In phase three, he's talking about in the thunderwizard.com Warrior 90 Day Lightning Qigong. We are now in phase three. Um, he says, which by the way, let me be clear because people go, oh, but if I'm not at phase three, how can I? So the way it works is when you go up to thunderwizard.com, you click around, you see Warrior 90 Day. You click on that, you subscribe. You get access to members only videos. And there's, if you, you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see level one or phase one. So you, you, you watch all the phase one videos, you do the phase one practices for 90 days. Doesn't matter if you join now or 10 years from now, it'll always be that way. So you can go there and start it at phase one, even though I might be on phase 20 by then. Doesn't matter. So you do phase one for 90 days. And then after 90 days, you go to phase two and you watch the phase two videos. And then you do those. You follow along. It's a press and play. I do it with you. You press play and you just follow along with me. And you can do that every day until you get it memorized, and then you can do it without having to do the video. And then after 90 days of that, then you get to phase three, and you click play on phase three, and I tell you what to do on that. Okay, so just to be clear, people seem to be unclear on, the, on how that works. He says, in phase three, while transitioning from the triangle to the fists, should the fists touch each other? Um, you know what, just... Don't worry too much about that. Uh, the fists the fist can touch each other, but don't make too big of a deal out of it. Again, yeah, that's the kind of question, Jedi Black Knight. You're already in the uh, you're in the five elements, so you know that save those kinds of questions again. You don't like it's true. You don't want to give away stuff to people who aren't there yet. Uh, ask me that in our one-on-one -on -one sessions. And um, you know, then we'll we'll see. Because I also need to see you. You know, I need to see your posture and your body type, and you know what's going to work best for you. Okay, so save that for later. Ding Shalik, my soul is very confident about being a successful teacher, but my parents programmed me that without having something on paper, it makes you untrustworthy. I have lower back pain because of this. Good. I'm not, I mean, it's not good that you have lower back pain. It's good that you're aware of your lower back pain. So this is your conflict. So there are two reasons that we're born. First one is we are commanded by our soul to live our soul desire. If it, I wish it were that easy. People say, well, if that's it, then why doesn't everybody just do whatever they want? Uh, because there's this other part. That's your dharma. That's your orlog. Your soul is your dharma, your path, your destiny. Not everybody lives their destiny. You have then your karma or your weird. And your karma is in order to fulfill your destiny, you must then face all of your unresolved past life issues. Because in a previous life, you had the same challenge. And the challenge is, this is all that life is. I want everybody to listen to me. Life can be boiled down to this one thing. Life is living your destiny and overcoming your karmic challenges. That's it. So every conflict that you have, you know, your 
you are telling me your your dharma and your karma your dharma is to be a successful teacher perhaps in qigong your karma is that you want your parents love and approval we all do even though people say no i hate my parents well that hate is 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 a reaction to love you can't hate somebody if you don't love them um, you know the the opposite of love isn't hate it's apathy it's lack of empathy you don't you honestly don't care you love me you hate me i don't really care if you exist hate is i know you exist and i hate you and i'm out to destroy you so even if you hate your parents and you're rebelling against them you still want their love and approval or you wouldn't hate them if you get underneath the hate you find a crying little child begging mommy and daddy to please love them i'm no different than you every human is the same so uh, the goal in life is one thing. It is to take the conscious action to fulfill your soul desire or your dharma and to face the conflict of your karma. My parents taught me to do this. My religion taught me to do that. My society says this. My friends say that. My school said this. And so you either want other people's approval, you want your mom's love, or you want your dad's approval, or you want the approval of their friends or your government, or you want to do what makes you happy, and you, it's not that you don't feel that, you have to like go through the pain of knowing that the more that you do your thing, teach your qigong, play your music, whatever it is, that the more that you do that, the more painful it's going to be. The more painful it's going to be that you're not getting that. You might even get them. They might even stand in front of you and say, what are you doing? You have to be licensed. You have to have some, um, something on paper. That's not real. Why, why are you doing that? I remember my, my, my wife, my now ex-wife, when I was married to her, I was teaching. And I was, you know, I was teaching and I was, uh, I was, doing counseling and life coaching and spiritual counseling. And I was talking with her and I said, I think I'm going to set my price at, and I set my price at the same price that, you know, my therapist was asking, because I figured I'm doing the same thing. She goes, she goes, you can't do that. I said, why not? She said, because you're not a therapist. I said, I know I don't have like a, I, I, don't, I don't have a PhD in therapy, but I'm, I'm doing the same kind of thing. I'm helping people. I'm counseling. So I believe that my time is as valuable as that guy. She says, no, you can't do that. You're not, you, you know, so she was telling me because you don't have a degree, you can't ask that much money. I couldn't believe it. That was my wife. She was complaining to me on the one hand, telling me I wasn't making enough money and then telling me that I didn't have the right to charge what I wanted to charge. That I didn't, that I didn't deserve it. Well, I decided to <laughs> to do what I wanted to do and she didn't it was the weirdest thing so you know anyway that was my karma is that I married a woman that reminded me of my mother that said the same kind of things that my mother would have said and um, so you know you your family and those people telling you that you can't do that unless you have something on paper they're just telling you what you were telling yourself in a previous life that you acted on. So in a previous life, you had that same thing. Let's assume you had the same desire. You wanted to be a teacher and you were a brilliant virtuoso violinist, but you hadn't graduated from the, you know, the Royal Austrian Academy of whatever the hell it is. And um, so you went ahead and you didn't teach because you didn't want to offend people. And you carried that with you. You didn't get over that. You came into this life. And now your desire to teach is coming up again. Your soul is saying, this is what makes me happy. And you're now thrust with that same issue. You manifested it. So this time, instead of choosing making other people happy, you're going to choose to make your soul happy. And you will feel the pain. You will feel guilt. You will have to face the anger because it will make you angry that you feel that you can't do what you want. You will then have to face the pain. It will make you sad that, that your parents didn't come to you and say, hey, you're valuable in and of yourself. You, just because you're alive, you have value. 
doesn't matter what degree you have. That doesn't mean anything. You're so valuable and amazing. You could start your own thing and we would support you in that. They didn't do that because you needed somebody to reflect that past life mistake so you can do differently this time and overcome the pain. Mourn. It's very sad when we don't get loved for being who we are. When we're loved for what we do instead of who we are, it's very sad. Now, the truth of the matter is you're saying, but you said earlier, people don't care about your, your uh, intentions. That's true. And this is why, you know, parents, you've got three years to get it right. You've got three years to teach your kids that they have value in and of themselves. Then when they have value in and of themselves, when they grow up, then they will have to live transactionally, which means they're going to be judged for what they do, not for who they are. But because they went for those first three years and learned to love themselves for who they were, when they have to go be this or do that, they will be able to love themselves. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I don't know what his parents did, but he had the ability to love himself through that. And his parents thought it was weird. Why are you doing that? You know, you shouldn't do that. And he did it anyway. He had enough self-love that he said, I don't care that this looks stupid to them. I don't care that they're not going to approve of me. I don't care that people call me a big, ugly, gap-toothed, you know, uh, lurch monster sort of thing that, you know, that I don't care that people say that about me. I love me and I want this and I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get it. And he did it. He's a perfect example. And whatever other problems he has in life or personality, you can't say that he didn't overcome obstacles to be whoever he wanted to be. Um, so it represents, he had this self-individuation. He was able to parent himself. He was able to love himself and accept himself. Okay? All right, what else? That's it. Seven sons. Um, we're not talking about any of that. So putting you in a timeout. If you got something to say, ask a question having to do with what we're talking about. Otherwise, don't waste our time. I don't come into your house and take a dump on your floor. <laughs> right? Don't come into my, my thing and dump an unrelated opinion about something we're not talking about. What else? Anything else? Um, yeah, you have lower back pain. So lower back pain, let's talk about that. Lower back pain is interesting because I've had periods of time when I wasn't successful and I was struggling and in conflict and I had lower back pain. And then I've had times where I've had a lot of success and a lot of money and I had lower back pain. So it's the same thing you're talking about. When I was struggling, it was because I didn't feel worthy. I didn't feel nourished because my mother, you know, I didn't feel nourished by my mother. So the universe becomes our mother. Money is, is mother's milk. So when people don't have money, they have lower back pain because the lower back is about the nourishment of the feminine, the water, the nourishment of the mother, the nourishment of the feminine. So when we don't feel energetically supported or nourished, we manifest that with poverty. And then we have an objective uh, excuse to say, yeah, see, I'm not, nobody supports me in my thing. Nobody supports me in my music or my Qigong class or whatever it is. People don't support me in my thing and I don't have any money. That's, that's what you tell yourself when you have lower back pain. The lower back pain is coming from the conflict of not feeling like you will be rewarded for living your truth, living your soul. So the other thing is that when you succeed, when you, you know, the, even though the, whatever goes on, whatever, whatever unconscious resistance or actual external resistance, people telling you you can't do that, if you do it anyway, then you live the conflict of the fear of I've just offended my mother. My mother's not going to love me. And even though you have the money now, the money doesn't have the same feeling or doesn't mean anything because that will mean that you're going to kill your mother. It's exactly what was going on with me. My mom, you know, I was going to say my mom kept me poor, but that's not at all what happened. Um, my mom would... Uh, would find ways to make me feel guilty if I was starting to become successful. Same with my ex-wife. 
My ex-wife would complain to me about I wasn't making enough money. But then when I started making money, she would then tell me I wasn't spending enough time with her because I'm working too much, even if that was just one or two days a week. So she was perfectly reflecting my mom who did the same thing. My mom would say, you need to be more successful. And then I'd go be more successful. And then she'd say, why are you doing that? That's just a stupid thing to do. You shouldn't be doing that. And, it was, and I felt guilty. Like if I was successful, I felt like I was killing my mom and my dad. I didn't know that. At the time, I would have told you, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Now looking back on it, that's what was going on. So the, even when you're successful, you might have lower back pain because the feeling that you're disappointing those whom you want love from. So that's all that lower back pain is. Uh, it, it's ju it just means you're either feeling unnourished because you're not getting the money or the success that you want from your parents or the world, or you are successful and you're afraid that's going to force your parents and the world and God to stop loving you and you're afraid you'll not be loved. So that's all that lower back pain is. So even though you're, you're, you have lower back pain, just keep doing it. Don't let it stop you. Just keep doing it. The more it hurts, you go, I've got to keep doing it. And sometimes you'll, you might end up on your back. I'm not wishing that on you. That happened with me. There were times when I was on my back for a week. I couldn't move because I, was, I had just launched a new um, teaching or a new video or a new, you know, something. And I, you know, went through my own conflict, internal conflict. But, you know, you have to, like, uh, like Jameson said, you have to you have to psychologically not physically symbolically and psychologically kill your parents so i've i've shared this before but there's uh only one uh story in the canonical new testament that i fully agree with and that is the mythical jesus was walking around somewhere in Palestine, Galilee, I guess it was, and he came across uh, he came across uh, somebody's house, and as he's walking by the house, a man runs out of the house and he says, uh, he says, "Master, master, I want to follow you. Please wait while I bury my parents." And uh, Jesus says to him. Let the dead bury themselves. If you aren't willing to abandon mother, father, sister, brother, you are not worthy of me. At which point the man hung his head in shame because he knew he had to bury his parents and he turned around and walked back. Now, that sounds very poetic and you'd say, well, yeah, of course, the dead bury themselves, except when you understand traditional Jewish even to this day, traditional Jewish uh, uh, culture is that one of the things you do to honor your parents is you immediately bury them within 24 hours. If you do not bury your parents within 24 hours, you are the worst, most evil person that's ever existed. And on top of that, you are heaping abuse upon your parents. The worst thing you can do, honor your mother and father. If you, that's like commandment number one. You can't screw that up. So for Jesus, a supposed Jewish teacher, to say to another Jew, uh, let your parents' bodies sit out in the warm, you know, primitive 2,000-year-old sun and rot and stink and follow me was blasphemy. He was saying, he was saying go, go kill your parents. It's the worst thing you could do. So the reason why that's in there is because on a psychological level, you must individuate. You must, quote, kill your parents. If you have parents that are loving, they will be teaching that to you as you grow up. They will be getting you ready. Whenever you accomplish something, they will say, I am so proud of you. You can do anything. I am so, and even if that's nothing, you just want to, you want to play tiddlywinks and, and live in a cardboard box. If that's what makes you happy, you are the best. I mean, how many people have the guts to do that? You're so amazing. You want to be king of the world and have more money than anybody? That's so amazing. I love you for that. They will support you in you being you. So when it goes, comes time to go do that, 
they will say, yep, it's time for you to fly, be free. You don't need us anymore. You don't call us for a week. We'll be fine. We'll take care of ourselves. We love you. Go do your thing. Go, go, go conquer the world. So to the, the degree that they did that, they're teaching the child to individuate, to love and parent themselves. And not all parents do that, most don't. To the degree that they don't do that, they are saying to the child, you only have value to the extent that you make me happy. Your feelings and your existence is meaningless unless it reflects on me. And I, you know, in my case, my dad was extremely successful, but because of how he grew up, he couldn't tolerate me being successful. And every time I would be successful, he would knock me down a few pegs. And he would humiliate me by telling me how he was so much more successful than I was at, uh, at my age. Um, and so I learned if I wanted my dad's love, I had to be mediocre. I had to be, I had to be smart and I had to be good at what I did, but I couldn't be successful. If I wanted my mom's love, I had to be dependent and I had to stay close and I could never leave her. If I left her, I was killing her. And so I had this perfect storm of being this very smart, you know, well-educated, you know, brilliant at whatever I did, but I had no success associated with it because that would have meant I was killing my parents. And so if you were to talk to me in my late 20s, I would have said, no, you don't understand. Hollywood has it in for me. I mean, unless you do this and unless you do that and it has nothing to do with your this and it has nothing to do with that. And, you know, so I let that define my acting career. And that's why I didn't, I didn't get any, any real success. And what was interesting is that when I did get success, like the one big, it wasn't a big film, but one of the, the film where I had like a lead role and the, the, film, the film was in theaters for like half a second. And, um, you know, I, I had the lead role in that. Um, during that film, my knee was like the size of a basketball. I mean, I could barely walk. I was in so much pain because the internal conflict of being successful you know, anyway. So um, did I answer that question? I think so. Uh, let's see. Vincent.thunderwizard.com said, I just invested in music equipment and I'm committed to pursuing music and everything else that makes me happy. Good for you, my friend. Good for you. All right. Nothing else? Okay, that's it for me. So you've heard me go here right now. Maushan.thunderwizard.com. Six hundred dollar savings i've just put up the wood element i finished um editing the metal element today but i'm not going to put that up right away so if you want uh to save six hundred dollars and immediately today get started practicing the footwork and the wood element go to maushan.thunderwizard.com and let's see let's might as well just play that for you let's watch that the promo I have for that. So if you go there now, you will save yourself $600. Don't wait too long because I'm purposely holding back the metal element because I want to give you guys some time. Um, but you, you'll save $600 while the just the wood element is uploaded. But once I upload the metal element, then it's going to go down. Each time I put up an element, uh, the price, uh, the, the savings will go down, the price will go up until it reaches its, uh, its actual price. 
and then once it's there it's going to stay there all right uh, and the idea is you will have you will be in the elite class of this Maoshan University here at thunderwizard.com all right so uh, any questions about that feel free to leave questions in the comment section and uh, I'll do my best to answer that um, so that's it guys uh, yeah nothing else for me right now all right I will see you guys when I see ya.